Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's APM webinar, Climbing the Project Management Profession Ladder Across Two Continents. I'm delighted that James can join us this afternoon. Uh, James is actually in Australia, and he's just told me it's half 11 in the evening, so I'm delighted he can join us. Uh, you'll find yourselves all on mute mode, but we're keen for your interaction today. So you can see that we've got Slido up and running. There'll be questions throughout the presentation, so please get involved. If you'd like to ask any questions of James, time dependent, I'll put these to James at the end of the presentation. Please submit these via your control panel. Today's presentation will count towards your CPD and should, no, should last no longer than an hour. I would personally like to say thank you to all the volunteers of the APM branches and the APM6 for all their energy with making these webinars happen. So James, James is passionate about delivering digital driven programs to improve the way people and organizations deliver their strategic objectives. So on that note, I'll pass over to James. Thank you, James. Thanks, Rob, and uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to chat to you about the insights that I've learned over the last roughly 20 years uh, of my career um, climbing the, the project management ladder. So without further ado, and it was interesting to see uh, where you're all from today. I see that uh, most of you are in the UK, some in Ireland, Scotland, uh, and somebody from W. So I haven't come across that one before, um, so I'll Google that later. So um, as Rob mentioned, so um, I've, I've gone through and um, climbed um, up to becoming a, a chartered project professional. Um, I'm, a, I'm also a fellow of the um, Association of Project Management. Uh, some of the other acronyms that you'll see uh, next to my name, so AICD in Australia, that's the Australian Institute of Company Directors, uh, and I'm a member of that. Uh, I'm also a fellow of the Australian Institute of Project Management, so that's like APM UK, uh, but the Australian version. And I'll, I'll talk through some of these others uh, later in, in my presentation or in my talk. So moving into the next slide. So the way I've structured this talk is to talk about three key phases. So the beginning uh, where I'll chat to you about the education that I went through and my UK experience. Um, then the middle part, which is where I moved to Australia and um, uh, started to gather credentials as well as experience working for different organizations. And then I'll move into the last sort of 10 odd years where I, I set up uh, my company, which is called PM Logic, and then further gained credentials uh, and, um, and obviously my chartered project professional uh, status, which I'm very proud about. So moving into the beginning. So I went to university in Bristol and I see that uh, we've got a few people from Bristol as well. Um, so this was one of my favorite uh, times when the hot air balloons would fill the sky uh, and uh, it's, it's definitely holds a, a special um, part in, in, in my, uh, my view, uh, Bristol. I lived in Bristol for a couple of years and uh, also in Bath for a couple of years. So I noticed that there's a couple of people from Bath as well. So I attended University of uh, West of England and um, studied mechanical engineering. So this is an image of uh, the new building that was um, created unfortunately after I graduated. Um, it's only a recent build, um, but I, I learned through mechanical engineering, not only the hard engineering skills, but a lot of the softer skills as well by including business studies, marketing, as part of uh, some of the elective um, elements that I studied. On the harder side, I studied uh, finite element analysis, computer-aided design, uh, robotics, so some real sort of interesting me metallics, etc., and uh, some real sort of interesting topics. And actually, uh, interesting enough, I got uh, invited to um, undertake a PhD for the British Dental Foundation. I decided against that um, after completing my degree, and the reason was I really wanted to travel. And so um, post uh, completing my degree, I took a year out uh, backpacking around the world. So I went uh, the wrong way around the world, started in the US uh, and then traveled to New Zealand, uh, to Australia, and, uh, and then through Southeast Asia, back through 
United Arab Am Am Emirates, uh, UAE, to the UK again. So roughly a year, it was a one uh, a one way ticket, and uh, and that's where I, I really fell in love with Australia, which is part of the reasons why I'm probably here now. So on returning to England, uh, I then started the job hunting. Uh, I had some casual jobs, um, not really related to engineering, and I was very fortunate to be selected uh, by Rolls-Royce PLC uh, within their graduate trainee scheme. So there's about 30 or people per year who are selected to undertake the scheme. And the scheme is aligned to the Institute of Mech Mechanical Engineers. So that allowed me to achieve my first chartership, which was a, as a charter professional engineer, um, once I'd obviously gained some experience post uh, completing that uh, graduate training scheme. So the scheme itself was actually sponsored by, or I was sponsored uh, through the scheme, I should say, by the project management department. So really that was my first intro to project management. Uh, first of all, working in the project management department before I spent three months working in other uh, departments as part of that scheme, gaining that experience. And then at the end of that, I um, was uh, part of the, the Trent 500 project. So the Trent 500 was um, the Rolls-Royce brand new um, triple school uh, aerospace engine, which is still used as the base uh, engine for all of their engine range today. So it was a revolutionary design that uh, allowed the engine to be lighter, uh, it was more fuel economic and quieter as well. So all the good things associated with, um, with traveling by air, which uh, in the days we could obviously. Um, um, so once I, and I was uh, part of the trainee scheme, I um, spent time within the, the PMO, the Trent 500 PMO. I also learned the value of uh, reporting at that point so uh, there was somebody in the team, uh, the manager, called Mike Richards. And uh, back in the day before Power BI and other uh, dashboards that we, we see nowadays, uh, it was very manual, putting together uh, charts of, of information, status reports, so your red, amber, green reports. Uh, so Mike would uh, pull these together on a regular basis um, to be able to report up and out, ultimately. And uh, part of my job was to gather information to help him complete those, as well as help the, the project managers and the, the program um, engineer um, to actually make sure that we were tracking on time. And we actually delivered uh, the Trend 500 ahead of time, which was a, a real great achievement for such a complex um, program in, in that case. So um, some of the exciting things that... Um, we I got involved with was uh, when I returned back to the project management department helping with developing the test beds so they're roughly a, a seven million pounds um, building it's a bunker um, that the engines are tested in so the the image on the left is the the test beds in Derby uh, and that's where Rolls-Royce PLC um, aerospace that is rather than uh, motor cars uh, is and uh, there was a, a refit at the time that um, I supported the project managers um, to complete, obviously, on time, cost and scope. And then uh, technology permitting, I'd like to just play you this uh, video, which is uh, one of the tests required that, uh, to ensure that the planes are, uh, or the engines are airworthy. So you can see there, it's quite a dramatic uh, explosion. Um, that was a, a, what's called a fan blade odd, off test. So one of 50 odd tests that are required to ensure that uh, if the blade within the engine does come off uh, through bird ingestion or other, that uh, the cowling actually contains um, that blade. It doesn't go into the fuselage and obviously go into where the passengers are. So that was a successful fan blade off test, quite a quite an interesting test to uh, to watch. Uh, what you're seeing now is the uh, the golf ball. So um, this is a huge, great metal device 
And this looks at um, the purpose of this golf ball is to allow uniform airflow uh, into the engine so that um, testing can be done very close to the ground and it can mimic what uh, the performance of the engine as if it was uh, high in the sky ultimately. So that was another project uh, that, that, that I supported um, to make to uh, develop a golf ball uh, to be used for, for these tests ultimately. And then on the right hand side, that's the water ingestion. So uh, planes obviously fly through heavy storms and the engine uh, needs to keep on running ultimately. So it's, it's a, a gas turbine, so it contains fuel. Um, so obviously you don't want the engine to go out whilst you're flying through serious water. And, and that's the, the test there. So um, through all that experience, um, I, I learned that project management was my thing. And I also learned that um, London was the place that I wanted to be. And I saw uh, many of you tonight, or tonight for me, today for you are in London. Um, and I was spending a lot of time commuting during the weekends to and from London to, to catch up with friends. So I decided it was time for me to find um, a job in London. And that's when I moved to a company called Raykel Instruments. So I initially helped the 3G program manager uh, with his uh, program. And then later uh, was given my own set of projects, which was focused around um, 2G. So enhanced uh, GPRS and two-way air interface monitoring which is basically you plug in the test equipment into either a phone or a base station and you monitor the traffic uh, from the other devices. So you can see here, um, there was a rapid change in, in mobile technology. So this is now coming into the, the 2000s and um, we were testing 4G within the lab at that time. And obviously it wasn't released um, until, well actually until quite recently. So, Whilst I was at um, Raykel, one of the things uh, focusing on education um, that I did was to become a, a Prince2 practitioner. And so that was probably my first uh, accreditation that was um, at the time UK based and now obviously globally well known. Um, uh, prior to that, um, obviously my time at Rolls-Royce, we, we did a lot of short courses. Um, there were internal accreditations that I gained. Plus also I spent three months studying psychology, specifically around knowledge management, which was with the aim of helping um, the experts who were likely to retire in 10 to 15 years um, to extract the knowledge that they'd gained before they retired and put it in uh, primitive sort of intranet systems. So back to Raykel, um, I became a Princeton practitioner and we use the Prince2 framework to develop the, um, the framework that our projects were run against. And we were actually awarded uh, by APM Group the best two Prince2 rollout at the time. So that was really exciting to, to be able to uh, win an award for, um, for this framework. Uh, and I was part of the, the team that supported that. So then um, we've got a, another uh, Slido. So if you wouldn't mind responding to this one, um, the question is, what did you study learn before getting into project management? So just whilst you're responding to that, and hopefully it's working. Um, oh, yep, yeah, good. So I'm studying law. I, uh, as I mentioned, so my background was engineering and then a little bit of psychology. Mechanical engineering is, uh, yep, yeah, that was my the focus of engineering. Interestingly enough, nowadays uh, in Australia, and I'm not too sure what the case is in England, I'm finding more and more people are now graduating uh, with project management as their first degree. So there are people entering the workforce now who have only studied project management. Uh, prior to that, people were studying sort of the first degree and then going on to study a master's of project management. So it's definitely an emerging discipline, which is quite exciting as a project practitioner to see. So I'll just leave that up for a few more minutes and just see what other elements are coming up. I'll also just take a screenshot as well. So 
So we've got quite a bit of engineering by the looks of things. Uh, geographies, languages. So obviously in project management communication is critical. English literature, sociology. I'm finding these, these non-hard skills as something that's emerging in our profession as well. I'm seeing more and more people from non sort of engineering bases coming into project management to support those that have come through that the more harder engineering type disciplines construction um, and I'm seeing that that, that uh, combination of skills actually supporting organizations improve their performance rates of projects psychology there as well ah photography excellent microbiology lots of very interesting topics Great, thanks everyone for responding to that. So that was the, the sort of first part, um, and as I mentioned, my time in England. Now I'm moving into sort of the middle part of my career, and that's um, where I moved to Australia. So 2002 uh, was the date that um, my wife, or my wife now, wasn't my wife at the time, and I, we decided to um, quit our jobs and uh, make the move down under and um, and obviously we're still here now so um, just waiting for the slide to appear there we go so um, Australia obviously and I'm in Sydney so uh, Sydney is well known for the Opera House the Harbour Bridge uh, interestingly enough on the um, Opera House it is uh, a project that's obviously it's a well-known um, building, one of it's a World Heritage site, but the project itself uh, was significantly over budget and over time, probably record-breaking. Um, so something like fourteen hundred times over over uh, time, and um, I think it was initially supposed to take seven years. Uh, and it took you know a lot lot more not 1400 that doesn't make sense uh, and the budget was significantly more as well it was uh, single figures uh, millions of dollars and it was over 100 million to complete so we're very glad as Australians it did get completed and uh, digging into that story that project would have never started had the full cost of the project been known so there was definitely a bit of political play in getting that project off the ground and uh, I'm sure some of you would have seen that in your organisations as well. The other thing we have in Australia is a wallaby. So I just thought I'd just play you this video, a bit of fun. So this wallaby is uh, travelling along our harbour bridge and uh, trying to make its way into the city. And uh, this is a, a, a police person uh, chasing it and obviously trying to, to capture that wallaby um, just before he makes it or she makes it into the city. So uh, a bit of a rare event, it, it made the news here. Um, this is ITV news, so I can see it also made the news in the UK as well. So in the move to Australia, um, my first job, I, I moved to Australia uh, around Christmas time um, and I'm a keen sailor. So uh, it was no point in trying to get work during Christmas. So I, I went and uh, joined a local sailing club and got my inshore skipper license and was basically sailing um, three to four times per week uh, in the Australian summer, which was just fantastic. Um, but it, uh, it didn't pay the bills. So I had to get a job and uh, I was lucky enough to get my first job in Australia with a company called Rogen Worldwide. And so Rogen International, Speakers International is probably uh, the better known arm of Rogen Worldwide, um, and they specialise in soft skills, so presentation skills, negotiating, leadership, media skills, etc. And I headed up their uh, e-learning business or multimedia, which was basically taking their their face-to-face uh, -face skills and uh, looking at a way that I could bring that into uh, an e-learning environment, so that uh, when participants attended courses. They could get pre-learning pre, pre -learning through uh, e-learning, uh, CD-ROMs, et cetera, at the time. 
and then post learning as well. So as a, a retention of that information. So that was leveraging some of what I'd learned uh, when I went to Nottingham University to study knowledge management, part of that psych degree that I mentioned earlier. What I found was um, they had another project running, which was their customer relationship management project. And uh, they actually had a project manager on that who had majored in English. And um, with my project management uh, knowledge, I ended up helping her and supporting her, which was fantastic. I also uh, helped to rebrand Rogen. The challenge I, I faced was Rogen at the time had uh, 14 offices around the world and each office had its own branding. So the challenge is when you're rolling out e-learning, there needs to be a consistency. So to get my e-learning rolled out, I needed to have that consistent branding. So I had to stay, take a step back to, to step forward with the e-learning. So major scope creep for those uh, project managers with us, uh, but a definitely a necessary element to uh, advance the e-learning. I also then helped to pull together a different product set, the, the training products from your A4 arch lever folders to creating an A5 uh, pack where a videotape that uh, participants use to record themselves and then play back so they can see their development over the time that they're learning. Um, the CD-ROM was in there and then an A5 manual as well. So that was really interesting working on these, um, these various packs. And what I learned through my time at Rogen was um, really around those humanistic skills. And on the right, um, the CEO at the time is, uh, was Neil Flett. So Neil uh, wrote the, the book Beyond the Pitch uh, and helped Sydney win the Sydney 2000 Olympics. Um, and he refers to that as the pitch of the century, uh, excuse the pun. And uh, it's fascinating to hear the strategy around how Sydney won um, the, the Olympics. So I definitely recommend if you're interested in, in that type of reading, uh, it's a really good book. So post uh, Rogan Worldwide, and just waiting for the slide to advance. So um, I worked for a number of different consultancies, all focused around the discipline of project management. There we go. So um, the first one I worked for was at Art Systems, and they were based in Canberra. So Canberra being the capital of Australia, uh, and I actually looked after their New South Wales office uh, and developed that. Then um, moved to a company called UXC, um, and I worked uh, under a couple of their brands, so Plan Power, which was their project management consulting arm, uh, as well as UXC Management Consulting, which was more around strategic consulting uh, and business transformation. Then moved to Agilon, uh, and Agilon is part of the ADECO group, but it's the consulting arm here in Australia, and uh, I looked after a team of consultants there. Again, business transformation uh, and multiple different types of projects. So. Through those uh, three organizations, I really started to, to learn about how project management disciplines being used in different organizational contexts uh, and the different elements of project management, the sort of the hard technical and construction to the softer skills in say advertising and media. Uh, and obviously now we're seeing a lot of that merging. Then um, I founded a company called Aspire Asia Pacific and that was the sister company to Aspire Europe, which is a UK-based uh, training company, training and consulting. Um, and, um, and that's where I then started to uh, accumulate some of my credentials again as well. So on the credentials, hopefully the slides are working. Might have to get you to advance it, Rob. It doesn't seem to be working for me. Thank you. So no on the uh, credentials, so this is where, as I mentioned, I already had my Prince2 practitioner. Uh, Prince2, obviously, 
the certification lasts for five years. So then I, I redid my certification. I think I've done it a few times now. Uh, I also went through and completed my MSP, uh, not just practitioner, advanced practitioner as well, and uh, P3O. Um, so P3O is the PMO management framework. Uh, all of these um, were under Axelos or under, sorry, the Office of Government Commerce. Uh, which is now known as Axelos. And um, so the certifications were under the APM group, um, and now it's an organization called PeopleCert who are the certifying body for those three. So um, I leveraged those, the PRINCE2, the MSP, and the P3O, to then become an accredited trainer in those three as well. So if I can advance again, please, Rob. So having accredited um, myself as a, a trainer, gained that knowledge, um, that entrepreneurial spirit was still um, calling for me and uh, running my own business was, was something, was a key goal that I always wanted to achieve as well as becoming a chartered project professional. Um, so uh, that's when I, I founded uh, the company that I now run, uh, which is called PM Logic. There we go. So, oh, mine's working now. You can go back one, Rob, and then hopefully if I change it next time, it will work. There we go. So PM Logic, uh, we specialize in helping executives uh, deliver their strategies in a sustainable way through project management. So on the right-hand side, uh, this basically just covers, and I'll just give you a very high-level snapshot, we're, we're principle centric. So I found my experience is that rather than rules, I abide by principles uh, and um, setting intents. So that, that's definitely helped me through my career. So also we've developed a framework. So I found that there's not one framework that covers everything. Um, and so what we would spent some time doing is developing what we call the five Ps which is purpose, people, practices, platform, and performance. And so that's an overarching framework that helps us to better deliver uh, transformational change to allow executives to achieve their strategic goals ultimately in a sustainable way. And sustainable, I'll, I'll touch on a bit later, but I, I mean that in two senses of sustainability. One is that they can do it themselves. The second is looking after the planet, which is one of our, our values. So um, the other thing we developed was a, a deliver framework, and I'll, I'll touch on that a bit later as well. So some of the elements uh, in PM Logic that uh, um, we went through and um, became accredited in was uh, becoming an accredited consulting organization, as well as an accredited training organization. So we introduced Agile Shift as well. So Agile Shift, for those that aren't aware, that's the business transformation framework that again comes out of Axelos uh, with the objectives of helping organizations holistically transform to new ways of working, driven by digital disruption and VUCA. So volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, as we've definitely seen in 2020 and obviously continue to see across the world with, with this, uh, this nasty COVID virus. So um, we also uh, maintained or, or uh, became accredited in PRINCE2, P3O, and MSP. And then on the consulting side, we undertook a number of P3M3 assessments. So for those that are not familiar with P3M3, that's Portfolio Program Project Management Maturity Model. And so there's three levels, the Portfolio Program Project, and there's seven perspectives or areas that we look at. For example, governance, uh, we look at management controls, and then risk stakeholders, etc. So that allows, um, and it allowed us to go into organizations and assess how mature are they against a, a benchmark and then provide or produce a, an improvement plan for them. So that really started to help me understand how organizations are operating and what improvements really work. What were the hacks? What were the quick wins? 
um, which I still use to this day. So I, I personally became accredited in all of these and then um, developed a team to help me with not only training, but the consulting as well. And then more recently I added, you'll see on the bottom right, ProSci. So ProSci is the uh, change management framework. Uh, I did a global scan and I felt the ProSci framework was one of the more rigorous frameworks. So ProSci itself, it, uh, it, it works off a, a biannual um, or every other year focus where it, it um, develops uh, a, a, a report based on a year's research. So that research for me as a, a change management practitioner is really helpful because I can cite that research when I'm going in and helping organizations transform uh, specifically around that people side, the all important people side. So uh, leveraging all of these accreditations and PM logic, um, we tend to undertake a number of health checks and these are um, very large health checks. For example, we've done a few health checks for Department of Defense here in Australia. Uh, and also um, interviewed people in the UK, uh, Ministry of Defence, to help to better understand the differences between Australia and New Zealand and where synergies and differences um, can help both, uh, both entities. Um, I'm, I'm a gateway reviewer, so, uh, and that's similar to the UK gateway review. In Australia, we have the same gateway review process. In fact, we have multiple. So each state uh, has its own gateway review process. And then federally, there's a gateway review processes. So they're very similar. They're all based on the UK gateway review, but they've all got their own uh, eccentricities. So as a gateway reviewer, we need to be mindful of um, what each state has to make sure we align to, to their requirements. Undertaking those pre M3 assessments, as I mentioned, and developing roadmaps, as well as improvement plans. So um, on the bottom right, um, one of the things that I've seen emerging over the last probably 10 years um, actively and probably throughout my whole career is Agile. And in fact, my belief is project management uh, was uh, Agile aligned before Henry Ford uh, started to develop the Model T Ford and uh, take very entrepreneurial farmers and put them on production lines where they needed to follow process. So for me, I think that was the change and the development of uh, what's often referred to as the waterfall traditional project management. Um, and I'm seeing now move to a hybrid model. And I definitely, when we're, I'm in with my team helping organizations improve, I'm, I'm recommending that they have both. Uh, in fact, not just uh, agile and traditional, that they actually include things like Lean Six Sigma, the ProSci frameworks. So really it should be a smorgasbord of different methodologies and tools so that way a project can select what's fit for purpose for it. That produces a bit more work. So obviously for larger organizations, they are able to actually withstand and, and have um, and support multiple frameworks. For smaller organizations, that can often be a challenge. So obviously, it does need to be tailored. And that's what a lot of these methods talk about is uh, tailoring, uh, tailoring the method to suit the organization and then embedding the method within the organization. So message on this slide is agile is very important. Um, and in Australia, we're seeing more and more organizations drop the project management name uh, and then now we're seeing it emerging, coming back again. So it's that pendulum swinging too far to just Agile. Uh, and they're finding that Agile obviously low on planning, low on documenting. It's very difficult to connect an Agile project back into the organization. So that's where these hybrid type uh, environments, so Scrum 4 is a, an expression I often hear. So moving to what you see in front of you now, which is our SIP. So SIP stands for Strategy Implementation Platform. So over the years, what I found is as we're going into organizations, we, we're helping executives and we're finding we're having to update digital systems. And we were finding that we were continuously having to repeat what we're doing. Uh, so we decided, well, it's best to develop our own one. 
And then if an organization doesn't have a, a digital system, they can just leverage R1 uh, and it gives them a head start with um, a, a platform that they can use. So SIP's based on Microsoft Project Online and on-prem. Uh, we've rolled it out in Department of Defense here in Australia uh, and a few other organizations in Australia. And um, it also has Power BI, we're using Power Apps, a lot of the Office 365 suites. Uh, so it really improves some of that collaboration. So as you can see, in, in, uh, we, on the left, we're leveraging a lot of those global best practices and those are some of the frameworks that we've, we've leveraged. Uh, I didn't mention Prince2 Agile uh, earlier. So Prince2 Agile, we actually dropped the, the Prince2 and training people in Prince2 for Prince2 Agile. Uh, because our view was that it allows people to learn the Prince 2, but also a little bit of Agile, and then obviously go on to becoming a Scrum Master and undertaking that education if they feel that that's uh, where they would like to go. So back into this slide. So in the middle, we've got our five Ps. Uh, that's the circle, so purpose, people, practice, platform, performance, and then our deliver framework, um, so those principles, those five principles interlink with each of the steps within our deliver framework. So we're finding any organization, in fact, any project, we can use this framework and you're welcome to as well. Um, there's a number of videos um, that we've put on, uh, on LinkedIn, on our PM Logic page, just talking through um, these frameworks and also interviewing people as well. Uh, so please feel free to, to, um, to look, at, look at those uh, and hopefully that helps you as well. And then at the bottom, um, we've developed what we call Be Radical and I'll, I've got a slide on that, so I'll come back to that. And then finally, the outcomes achieved. So we're finding that by le leveraging this common way of working and bridging the gap between strategy and delivery, we're able to make sure that there is an alignment between strategic intent and the work being done in organizations, which helps obviously improve the success of change. It, it means that there's a mature governance structure in place, uh, as well as making sure there's uh, inclusion and diversity, uh, which is all important in this, stage, in this age. So different thinking, as well as safety, particularly work health and safety, for example, with COVID, thinking about mental health, health uh, safety, uh, as well as the physical safety for construction sites, et cetera. Improved agility is another element. So um, the pace of change is obviously significantly increasing. And so by having common ways of working, it helps to improve that organizational agility and keeping stakeholders informed. So when I say managing stakeholders, it's really informing them as to what is happening within this project program task. Um, so there's better transparency ultimately, and with transparency builds trust. That uh, then obviously improves the effectiveness and the efficiency of the way the projects and the programs as well as portfolios run, and uh, also reduces risks. So I mentioned this uh, Be Radical. So Be Radical, um, in Australia, a lot of organizations have something called RAID. So RAID is the risks, actions, issues, and decisions. Sometimes it's risks, actions, dependencies. Um, so RAID is used in different uh, terminology. So what we decided is to put that on steroids and expand it out to all the list items that uh, we've developed actually within our, our SIP platform. So I'll just read it round. So we've, we've, um, the B stands for benefits, R stands for risks, and then we've got actions, dependencies, decisions, issues, communication, change, assumptions, and lessons learned. So you can think of all of these as list items. And what we've done is we've developed uh, relationships between those lists. So for example, an assumption in a business case should have a related risk or a, a number of risks that relate to that assumption. So it's not just lost in the business case. Then there should be regular reviews of those risks and potentially actions for people to do something. There could also be issues so that risk can come to fruition uh, and therefore an issue is created. So we've, we've developed a relationship between those various items. So it allows 
people working in a project program and even portfolio environment to navigate through that. One of the key things uh, and the lessons that I've learned through my 20 years career is dependency management is poorly done and often one of the key challenges with uh, successful rollout of uh, projects is uh, the dependency that there's people, the unknown unknowns. So we've, we've got a list and uh, we spend time helping organisations capture dependencies. Uh, I mentioned the assumptions, that's another one that we see the business case when it's written tends to just be for approval and then it's filed away. So we try to bring that to life and, uh, and automate and digitise the information within it. Finally, lessons learned. So lessons are learned by individuals, not by organisations. So we try and ensure that those lessons actually have the context uh, and that's where putting it into a system and then allowing uh, a workshop or a video to be captured where uh, individuals familiar with that lesson talk to it and then the organisation is to capture that and learn from it and hopefully not repeat the mistakes of the past. So that's the that's our, our B radical. Um, so the other thing that we'd spend, I personally spend a lot of time doing now is executive coaching. So that's predominantly around program and project governance and delivery, as well as mentoring. So I really enjoy mentoring uh, new project people, people coming up through the ranks, uh, or even people new to, to project management. I was the uh, New South Wales president uh, for just over four years. Um, so that's like being um, an area um, lead, I think, I don't know what it's called in, in the UK for APM, um, or maybe running a community of practice. Um, so I looked after the state here in New South Wales. Uh, and then uh, I was elected to the AIPM board, which is where I sit now. And I've been on board for about a year as a director of AIPM. So with that, it allows me to support, there's about 10,000 uh, members uh, and just under 30,000 uh, in our community in Australia and so it allows me to support uh, that community with sessions like this uh, which I really enjoy doing as well as one-on-one -on -one mentoring and coaching as well. So uh, just focusing on some of the extra learnings and principles uh, and methods uh, over the last 20 odd years. So one of the things I took advantage of 2020 uh, being a really uh, a challenging year for anyone uh, or most organizations uh, unless you're one of the fortunates like uh, Zero or Zoom or those that are have absolutely you know increased substantially as a result of COVID a lot of organizations have, have struggled and, and PM Logic has as well so uh, I didn't sit on my laurels I decided to um, put that time to good use that uh, I suddenly found myself having. And I, I co-authored a book called The Strategy Implementation Gap. So a lot of what I've chatted about um, is captured in, in this book, as well as some of the, the focus on sustainability as well. Um, so uh, it's on Amazon um, uh, and you, know, you can, there's a, a Kindle version as well as a physical hard, physical copy as well. So if you've liked what you've heard today, uh, please go on and, um, and buy, buy that book. So in the book, I talk about the, the principles, uh, our five principles, talk about the delivery method, talk about digitization as well, and obviously um, talk about sustainability and the way that we've leveraged the, the global sustainable goals. The other thing I did, uh, which I'm very proud of, as I mentioned, is become a, a chartered project professional. Um, I think uh, there wasn't very many in Australia when I, I managed to get on, on the second wave. Um, and uh, and I'd just like to take you through the approach I took. So um, I initially became a certified practicing project director, which is under the Australian Institute of Project Management uh, Reg PM certification process which is what you see on the bottom left. I then uh, leveraged that um, to then become a, a certified projects director. So that's a level A certification under uh, IPMA, so the International Project Management Association. 
Um, and it meant that the assessments um, took in the evidence that I submitted for my Reg PM uh, to certify myself as the uh, level A. Uh, and actually the focus there was more on behavioral elements, uh, which actually I got a lot of out of through the conversations and providing the evidence. And then uh, undertaking the chartered project professional, um, again, going through the process of actually um, becoming a chartered project professional. The one thing that really stood out for me was becoming uh, a, re a reflective practitioner. So reflecting on events like this and um, working out, so what am I taking from this event? What am I going to do as a result of this event? And I, my last question is on that. So I'm hoping that that's a, a takeaway for you as well. So if you haven't uh, started this journey uh, or you're interested in becoming a, a charter project professional, definitely do it. It's, um, for me, it's something that is, is very special. It's special for the project management industry to have this acknowledgement that uh, it is a profession. And for those of you that are professionals, Congratulations. Um, for me, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great recognition of, of what we can do. The final element I wanted to chat to you about is the giving back. Um, so there's, as I mentioned, the UN Sustainable Goals. So we focus on um, two goals uh, under those uh, Sustainable Goals, so four and 15. So four is quality education, which is where our training business uh, does a lot of pro bono work. Uh, and supporting, mentoring, etc., as well as 15, which is life on land, and we do a lot of work with planting trees. So the, the four um, organisations we're currently supporting, so AIPM, as I mentioned, um, the, uh, uh, what, the Foundation for the National Parks and Wildlife. So we recently ran a webinar where we contributed all the proceeds to planting trees. Uh, which then help koalas uh, and obviously help with uh, global warming, etc. School for Life, um, and so School for Life focuses on helping children in Uganda get an education, so an amazing cause. And then the Smith family. So the Smith family helps, again, um, underprivileged children in Australia uh, get an education, uh, and they sponsor about 1,500 children uh, and mentor them as well. So really um, worthy causes that we really truly enjoy supporting and helping. So uh, that's the what I'd like, that's my talk. Um, I would like you, if you would like to, to link in with me. Um, um, I write a lot of blogs, do a lot of videos, etc. So hopefully um, I can share with you something of interest and I'd like you to share back to me um, what interests you as well so that I can learn. Talking of learning, uh, the final poll is as a result of attending this talk, what are you going to start, stop or continue with greater focus? So what I mean is, is it what's the takeaway? What things are you doing today that you think I, I shouldn't need to be doing that anymore? Or what have you learned that you think, yep, I would like to start doing that, perhaps applying to become a chartered project professional? Or what are you doing already? And, and you think, yep, I'm gonna continue doing that. So um, please just start posting, start, stop, continue. And uh, I'll be interested to see what you put. Very good. Oh, moving to Australia, great, yep. Definitely recommend that. So I see a, a lot of uh, giving back. So for me, uh, it's very rewarding to give back. Um, not necessarily financially, more around community and relationships. Um, so the volunteering for APM, I know that APM runs a number of events and there's volunteers that help that. Um, it's that sense of community and I think as human beings, we need that sense of community. So uh, yeah, if, and it, it doesn't have to be in project management as well. Uh, I volunteered 
uh, as I mentioned, when I moved to Australia, I, I helped out at the sailing club. And, you know, that was really rewarding. And that was a, um, a building a, a sailing community as well. So I see a lot of people um, doing the uh, CHPP. Definitely recommend that. And I know there's a lot of help there as well. So APM have uh, some really good information on the steps you need to take uh, as the bottom point there, getting to CHPP. Um, evidence is going to be your biggest challenge uh, from my experience. Um, and uh, it may take a bit of time. And obviously, if, if you're working in places like Defence, um, gaining the right permissions, um, the process the assessors go through, um, they do assess defence people. So there's obviously an agreement around security and uh, the way information is used and then disposed of once the review has been completed. So a great thing to do. Education I see coming up as well. So doing the masters, the P3O, um, the P3O, I think PMO management is definitely an emerging discipline. Um, my own view is that people, particularly leaders within the, the, the PMO space, need to have experience either running projects and hopefully programs as well. So when they go into the PMO, they can then coach and mentor the project program managers that are actually delivering those uh, projects and programs. The other thing I would like um, or I'd recommend you do is to uh, if, if there's if you're in a big organization and you've got a, a project program manager that's got a, a, a pause between or a gap between two projects or programs pop them in the pmo for a while and get them to share and update what they've learned some of the methods the frameworks etc before they get redeployed so it's a really good way of continuously improving the way the organization operates Wonderful. So lots of really good comments. Thank you, everyone, for your wonderful contribution. And the last slide. So we've got six minutes now. So I know Rob's been busily reading all your comments on um, the, the chat as well. So Rob, any questions coming through? Yes, certainly, James. But firstly, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your experience and also overcoming those small little technical challenges along the way, um, I'm sure. And going by the comments that are coming through, everyone's enjoyed hearing from you. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, thanks. It's been a pleasure to be here. And thanks, everybody, for your time as well. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I can see a couple of people have asked about the content. Um, James is kindly allowing us to record this. So we're going to make it available on APM YouTube along with all the other webinars uh, and virtual events we've uh, held in the in the past uh, year, I'd say. Um, also in your control panel, uh, there's some supporting information about becoming chartered professional with the APM. And also, if you keep an eye on the APM website, I, I noticed some people were talking about CPD. We've got a lot of events coming up. Um, so I'll move into the, the questions. Someone said, um, and you kind of touched on this, you talked about uh, it's a good mix and it converts into a scrum master. But Melanie has asked, what do you think of Prince2 Agile? Yeah, so as I mentioned, I think for me, if, if you're toying up, do I do Prince2 or Prince2 Agile? I definitely, well, my context Australia, so in Australia, I'm recommending people do Prince2 Agile. Um, I'm not too sure what it's like in the UK. In Australia, we have a lot of uh, project managers that have done PMBOK. So they, they do their PMPs. Um, and so I'm finding that actually having the, the agile element helps people with uh, going into a PMBOK environment add that extra bit of, of knowledge as well. So um, yes, my 100% Prince to Agile. Excellent, thank you, James. Uh, Tom's asked, have you got any recommendations for additional reading or learning about the psychology of knowledge management? Great question. Um, so knowledge, I mean, there's, there's a whole discipline around knowledge management. Um, probably I would recommend, I don't have any specific sort of books um, that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I think knowledge, I mean, first of all, learn about the, the structure of information. I think that's probably a really good starting point. Um, so very briefly, you've got data at the bottom level. 
then you've got information, then you need to add context to that information, which is where you get the knowledge. So I I'd definitely recommend doing some Googling, finding out if there's information around that. Then um, how to share information. So understanding that each piece of information needs to be put specifically into its place so you can find it again. So if you look at productivity, people spend an enormous amount of time searching for stuff, and I, I do as well. So if you can create a way that allows you to better store information so you can retrieve it more easily, it's going to make your life a lot easier as well as your colleagues, your friends, etc. So sorry, I don't have a specific on that one, but definitely Google. Google's your friend. Yeah. Google, yeah, Google is a, a friend of many. Um, but thank you for that, James, and I hope that helps you, Tom. Um, I've got a question from John, who's picked up on your uh, opening slides where you discussed your career moving from engineering organization to a data comms to multimedia to finally running your own business. And John has asked, how would you say moving around in your career has helped you? Yes, it's interesting. I mean, it, um, it was probably quite rare when I did, I was moving around quite a bit and most people weren't at the time. I think now there's a lot of moving around. Uh, so millennials, um, my team, for example, I've got quite a few people that are, uh, are young. And um, if I can hold on to them for a long period of time, I, I think that's great um, because they, it's not a job for life anymore. So for me, moving organizations has helped me understand what was working well in a prior organization and what wasn't, what could be improved. Um, and it's those adjacencies. So I'll give you a very quick example. Um, Formula One, so health, have a, a problem in triaging patients when they hit accidents and emergency. Formula One do exactly the same as a car, drives into the pit stop, they have to work out what needs to be done in this car and get it out as quickly as possible. So health people have spent time looking at the Formula One pits uh, people to understand how they operate, what tools do they have, and they've taken that knowledge back to the health to improve the triage process. So those synergies and those um, elements are something that has really helped me in jumping around a bit. Excellent, thank you, James. Um, I'll definitely send through these comments, but uh, Kate has said thank you for the over, um, for the great overall presentation and also providing answers to the questions. Um, there are some additional questions which I'll send through to you, and, and if you have time, we'll then send those back out to the people that have asked them. I suppose my final question is not related to project management, but your um, your love of sailing. Um, do you have a, a favourite for the America's Cup? I know that's yeah. taking place yeah. at the minute, but surely cheering on the UK as opposed to the New Zealand team. Yeah, there's a, there's a, f a friendly rivalry between Australia and New Zealand. So, uh, and I've actually got an uncle and aunt that live in New Zealand. So, uh, yes, uh, I think I, I'll, I'll go there, back the English, and uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> excellent, excellent, James. So, um, thank you again for sharing your knowledge and, and also uh, the time difference as well. I know it's uh, 12.30 uh, midnight there. So, I'm very grateful for your time and your knowledge. Thanks, Rob, and thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Excellent. Thank you, James. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's great to see so many people have joined us. Um, I can see from the comments, which I will pass on um, to, to James, um, you've definitely enjoyed today's presentation, and thank you for contributing in the slidos and also the additional questions. Um, if you have any questions around uh, being a charter professional, please reach out to us. Um, but as I say, there are some handouts in your control panels as well. So it just leaves me really to say thank you again to James. Thank you to everyone for attending. Keep well and happy in 2021. And we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Bye for now.